Let the chaos reign. Chaos reign presents. Let's talk about black people. Broadcast January the 19th, 2020. Enjoy. Talk Real Solutions hosted by Tyrone Thompson at TalkRealSolutions.com are the views of Tyrone Thompson and do not reflect the views of TalkRealSolutions.com, YouTube, or etc. The content here belongs to Talk Real Solutions and its many contributors. Views and opinions expressed by all contributors belong to them and not TalkRealSolutions.com or Tyrone Thompson, the host, or etc. All data and information provided Provided on the site is for informational purposes only. Talk Real Solutions makes no representations as to accuracy, completeness, correctness, suitability, or validity of any information on this site and will not be liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses, injuries, or damages arising from its display or use. All information is provided on an as-is basis. In a world where there's crime, corruption, violence, rape, murder, death, and all forms of atrocities that plague the world in which we live in today, what you went to see, we are living in a state of chaos. And it'll take a greater, much extremer chaos to restore the order in which we live today. Good evening, Black people. This is chaos here. And tonight, this is an open conversation. And... We're going to say, let's talk about black people. This might be very controversial tonight, potentially. It might hurt some feelings, possibly, or it might influence or give more power 
to people or inspire. But nonetheless, the message has to be let out tonight. So before I start tonight, I'd like everybody to go to talkroasters.com. And on talkroasters.com, you'll see the three-point plan for black empowerment, black achievement. And under the three-point plan, you'll see a list of black established on banks. Right now, and if people check the website, we are starting to slowly lose a lot of these black owned banks. I've been always been harping that there was roughly close to thirty still present, but what I've noticed now that it started to that number started to dwindle. And the reason be because a lot of our people don't <laughs> support these institutions. And I say black banks are much more superior, better than the regular commercial banks from Bank America. Wells Fargo, TD Ameritrade, I mean, um, TD Banks, um, People's Bank, all these form of institutions. Um, at the end, of it, this is what is really our form of black banks that still exist in. Um, and I always harp for every broadcast that if you're near a black bank near you, it wouldn't hurt to invest and put some of your money into a black bank. Besides the other checking accounts you open on your local bank. So, you know, like always, you know, always, you know, support anything that's established and, you know, for our people. Um, so, you know, you'll find that in the website, talkrealsolutions.com. Also, you'll find the latest articles, information, and news on the website as well. That's also could be found on talkrealsuch.com. And you could also find this broadcast and many other broadcasts on YouTube titled Talk Real Solutions. And that's Talk Real Solutions with the S at the end. We're also located here on YouTube. Um, and, you know, you'll find my streams, other streams from ABC, and I'm not sure who else does shows here on Talk Resolutions. This is pretty much a seven days a week show. And always, if you're interested in doing the podcast and doing these type of calling shows, you could hit up um, Talk Resolutions or Tyra Thompson through Facebook, or you could leave a message the comment section of this stream or many others. And I believe there's an email here too. Let's check. Mm, I don't see it. So I believe talent's going to have to probably address that. People want to come in and do shows on talk resolutions and, and get get a feel of how podcasting works. So many options you could take this. So, you know, if you're interested, you know, hit, hit up talk resolutions to know more information. Also, we have a donation piece of um, how I say um, you could donate as little as the show. I think via PayPal or you know whatever, and that's also located on YouTube and on the website as well. So all the information is there. So check it out, donate, you know, and you know support you know media. Okay. So now, before I go in, uh, well, actually, two major subjects tonight, and depending on how I go through this, you know, it'd be good for me, but it's to not to really, um, I guess, shows in one. But, you know, but the first, as I will pull up, what I'm about to play for y'all. And it bogged me a little bit. And regardless to, you know, not only how people have gone a long way from the physical shackles of oppression, whip, speech, change, slavery, you, know, you hear all this stuff. But once our people were left to their own devices, but left alone to really manage and su survive through this Western environment, what has proven that we have very much exceeded and thrived very well 
during the time when we were let go physically. And, you know, as y'all know, when Lincoln got, you know, killed back in the early 60s of the 1800s, that he did put certain things in place to give the descendant slaves something as that leave them empty-handed. But turn around four years later after that was title was given to him, it was fully, you know, taken away a little bit through extra policies, which I can't really elaborate going to say. But that was the thing that was going on. When people say, you know, people want they were gonna give you a forty acres of meal. They did hold up to their end but only for the after enslavement and two, three years later it was fully taken back away. Through, you know, the so called policies that this country gave by other four forefathers. What you're gonna hear after the first I would say um ninety something years and this video slash recording was recorded back in the mid 50s particularly 1954 and this deals with you know how to sell with the negro or the psychology of selling to the negro and it's going to be a give you a background of how black people were living during that time during what we call separation so as I play, I will give brief commentary on my insights. Enjoy. You can't keep war. There are good prospects for practically all times. Yes, this is the market we're talking about, the new Negro family. Their name is Wells or Wilson, Smith or Brown or Alexander or Breen. They live in Chicago, in Atlanta or New York, in Detroit, St. Louis. Los Angeles, any one of a thousand cities and towns. All over the country, families such as this are enjoying new prosperity. They have new interests, new standards of living, a buying power they've never enjoyed before. They're good prospects for practically all types of goods and services. All too often, though, they're overlooked prospects. Why? Because of some good, valid reason? No. They're overlooked because of mistaken ideas, because of out-of-date ideas about how the Negro lives and how he buys. The truth of the matter is that the Negro lives pretty much the same as other folks. He buys pretty much the same way, too. But just the same, a lot of old doubts and opinions keep cropping up over and over again. 
Oh, I don't like to do business with Negroes. They're drifters. You can't keep track of them. Yes, although a lot of people think that way, the truth is that one out of every three Negro families living in cities today owns its own home. That figure comes directly from the United States Bureau of Census. Uh, maybe so, but Negroes are poor credit risks. Not more of a credit risk than any other group. Actually, the Negro home buyer meets his payments faithfully, often more faithfully than other race groups in the same economic level. That's the information. Hold on. I thought we had we had people not go with credit. Mm. 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 How we how long we have come away for the last when that was first recorded, 1904, 2020. That is a period of 60, now 66 years. So I wonder, what really changed? Let's keep listening. We got from people who ought to know, the National Association of Real Estate Boards. Well, maybe, but I've always heard that Negroes buy shoddy, poor quality merchandise. No, it's just the other way around. According to leading researchers, in proportion to population and income, Negroes buy more quality products than any other comparable United States group. You see, there are a lot of confused notions about the Negro customer. But when you dig right down and find out about them, they just don't hold water. Negroes own homes. They meet their payments faithfully. They buy good brands of merchandise. So why let a lot of old-fashioned ideas hurt profits? Take a look at the real facts. Here in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, some amazing facts and figures about this new market have been uncovered. For a first-hand report, we would like to take you directly to the United States Department of Commerce to hear this story from the Secretary of Commerce himself. Here is the Honorable Sinclair Weeks, the Secretary of Commerce of the United States. In the Department of Commerce, we are constantly alert to trends that mean a healthier national economy, better business for the nation as a whole. Recently, we have been interested in a rising young market, one that represents a huge potential for goods and services. I'm referring to the new Negro market. The tremendous buying power of this group is backed, of course, by an increased earning power. The average Negro family's income is at a record high. In fact, since 1939, it has increased more than the average income of all other Americans. Just take a look at a few figures. You hear that? Since the 30s, going on to 1954, which is a period of 15 years, it has kept going up. Now, as y'all are aware, America went into what we call the Great Depression during the 20s. Now, mind you, most ADOS people during that time, in that country during that time, didn't have no concern in regards to so-called a depression because majority of our people depend where they're at in America, certain states. Some might have took hit off that. But some managed to come out okay. And last time I checked, the few that really got took a hit during them times was non-black people, Europeans, Irish, Italians, Jews, you know, all these brand labels of Europeans, where they were eating on soup kitchen. And you heard how bad it was during the Great Depression. But they didn't tell how much the Negro, a.k.a. ADOS black people, gone through during the same depression. Because during that time, most black people didn't really get the, the serious fruits of America like that, but was able to come out all right. But that's something they don't talk about. Matter of fact, during, before the Great Depression happened, most of the cities that black people ran and controlled were thriving even better than certain cities and that was controlled and that was populated by European people, a.k.a. Caucasian people. They went in and started destroying certain black cities because they were doing so well. That really initiated and eventually 
started what we call Great Depression. So for the past 15 years, since 1939 and 1954, their production and their so-called wealth and the position in America started to increase much more fluid and faster than other ethnic groups in that country. So I want you to keep that in mind as I continue on. An official Department of Commerce report shows that at least one-third of the Negroes living in cities earn from two to $5,000 a year. Today, the average Negro wage earner brings home a paycheck four times larger than the one he collected in 1939. As a whole, the Negro market has a total income of about $15 billion every year. And after taxes, Negro families still have many billions of dollars to spend. Here is a buying power that cannot help but have a tremendous effect on our national economy and on business prosperity in general. When these dollars are spent for a wide range of goods, services, and employment, business everywhere is bound to feel the impact. This new buying power has resulted in a class Negro market a profitable, above-average income group of consumers. For example, the nation's largest newspaper and magazine research organization, Daniel Starch and staff, reports these significant figures. More than 51% of the readers of Ebony Magazine have a record player in their home. Almost 64% own a television set. And almost 78% enjoy the convenience of an electric refrigerator. It is also a fact and this is from the magazine The Food Field Reporter, that Negroes spend almost $3 billion a year for food alone. Per capita, they buy more cosmetics, drugs, and toiletries than anyone else in the country. And their children are better educated, too, because since 1930, enrollment in Negro colleges is up 2,500%. But really, to recognize the importance of this class... Let's pause again. If y'all didn't know, let me tell you a little secret. During after enslavement, because you know certain black people weren't able to, you know, especially men or women, weren't able to read and do things like everybody else in this country because they were considered um, chattel. Once the physical enslavement ended, what people noticed, and they've been keeping progress of the so-called ADOS black man, black woman in this country is that the literacy rate out of other racial groups during the 19th century, which is 1800s, jumped and was much greater than every other ethnic group that come to this country during the mid to late and beyond 1800s. Now, mind you, to find out back in the 50s that a lot of the enrollment of the so-called Negro college where, you know, HBCUs that black people attended because they didn't attend like every other college. They were outperforming everybody else much faster within that span of almost a century after physical slavery end. So when I hear these things about, you know, black men, black women can't do certain things that they have, their IQs are slow. And also, no, it's just some of them that have the potential to have the opportunity to, you know, educate themselves, be with our school systems or all that stuff, thrive. And they thrive much faster than other groups of people. Even now, the ones that you hear from this documentary that has their families and they live in certain areas where they educate their own, the literacy rate skyrocket. Math, reading, all this performance go up the roof. And the reason and the secret to that is because we were teaching our own. That's why when you look at it, when we talk about the things that correct in the black community, these are the things that we have to take control for ourselves. There is no way around it. And they know this. That's why, you know, when they monitor the progress of black people after a slavery, they're astonished that, say, 
when I let this Negro man go, especially man, he is not only able to outcompete me, but he fries much faster than my own. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Well, let's continue. That's Negro market. We must realize that something has been happening economically in our country. People are on the move. The population is shifting. The makeup of metropolitan populations today is different than it was just a few short years ago. To give you a better idea of what we mean, we set up several cameras, candid cameras, in a number of shopping locations. Take a look at these shoppers. Notice what a large proportion of them are Negro. What's the reason? It's simply this. Negro families are moving into the city where there are more job opportunities. Here they find occupations with more prestige and security, jobs that pay more money. As a result, Negro families today often make up the largest part of central city consumer prospects. A shoe store in Chicago's Loop, for example, reports that more than 50% of its customers are Negroes. In another case, a drugstore located at a transfer point in a non-Negro neighborhood finds that its Negro customers total 25%. The trend is plain. The new Negro families today are moving into more populated areas, to the cities, where there are more stores, more buying opportunities. Since 1940, in San Francisco alone, the Negro market has increased by 89%. In Chicago, by 81%. Houston, Texas, 45%. Philadelphia, 50%. The impact of this new buying force is so tremendous that actually in 14 major United States markets, a product cannot be number one without Negro support. A product must have the backing of this big new buying power to be a leader in the field. What do you have to sell? Chewing gum or cars? Toothpaste or transportation? Whatever it is, here are millions of prospects. And these prospects are everywhere. Negro customers can no longer be pigeonholed. They cannot be classified as prospects who trade only in certain stores certain neighborhoods. Today, Negroes shop downtown. They shop in supermarkets. They shop in small neighborhood stores. They'll buy from anyone who wants to sell to them. But we all know that before you can sell to customers, you've got to get to know them. You must understand something about them. What do the Negro customers buy? Why do they buy? How do you sell to them? Let's find out. Let's hear the opinion of men who have spent a lifetime studying the buying habits of customers the world over. Here is what sales psychologists have to say about selling to the Negro. The secret of selling to the Negro is expressed in one word. That word is recognition. Now, there's nothing unusual about that. People want to be recognized. They need recognition. That's basic in all of us. But perhaps because he's had so little of it, the Negro needs even more. He needs to feel important and appreciated. This need is a very real and important one. It shows up... Now, mind you, one of the reasons why the ADOS man and woman at times needs appreciation, validation, etc., is because, like always, you're trying to feel good and want others to see that you're something. So to stand out, you got, you know, have that image. So the story that you see in this particular documentary is, you know, the black man trying to look good so everybody else could see him so he could stand out throughout the crowd. So that's a validation of it. Even in many of the Negro shopping habits, anyone who sells or wants to sell to the Negro customer should know about some of these habits. Three habits in particular play a big part in every sales transaction. To begin with, most Negroes buy by brand. They ask for products by name. They're quick to turn down off brands. Do you wonder why? Well, listen to what this customer is thinking. Hmm. That last hat I bought, 
just didn't hold up at all. You see, for a long time, the Negro has been sold a lot of shoddy, second-class merchandise. So now he asks for name brands in order to make sure he gets his money's worth. Buying by brand, that's the first important Negro buying habit. Now for the second. The Negro buys good quality merchandise. Symbols of quality and prestige are very important to the Negro customer. This woman, for example, is buying fine crystalware. But she is also buying the admiration and approval of her friends and relatives. Listen to her thoughts. My, isn't it beautiful? I can hardly wait to show it to Sally and Joan. It's a well-known fact that many Negro customers are influenced by the opinions of others. What their friends may think of a certain item often decides whether or not the sale is made. So remember, the Negro buys quality merchandise. That's the second important point. And here's the third thing to remember when selling to a Negro customer. When he specifically asks for one thing, don't try to sell him something else. Don't try to switch him at the point of sale. If you do, he'll probably react something like this. Doesn't he think I've got the money to pay for it? There's a reason for this reaction. Again, because he's had experience with cheap merchandise, the Negro resents being offered a substitute. He wants to be sold on quality, not price. The Negro buys by brand, he buys quality, and he doesn't like to be switched at point of sale. These are the keys to selling the Negro customer. Another point. The Negro family does things together, as a group. The family works as a And as I know, things that he, he will spend more money because of the so-called quality because better. And sadly, mistake, you know, back then, you know, most of our people, then, you know, depending on what they bring home and the price of the product, you know, not much was worth. But the rules apply no different today. You'll see Negroes or ADOS black men, black women today, will buy very much expensive things. Like let's say they buy the Nikes, they'll buy the um, Louis Vuitton, the Gucci, all these you know name brands. Even some one time they used to buy the the Beats head headset because of the brand. They will spend those hundreds and hundreds of dollars for just to look good to impress others. It's a weird psychology, but that's how our people, you know, not only act back then, still act today. But, yeah. Unit. It lives as a unit, and it buys as a unit. When you sell to one member, you many times sell to all. It's also true that many places of entertainment are still closed to the Negro. So he spends more of his money for the things that are available to him. Often, for items that are considered luxuries. Another trait of the Negro market is the fact that it is a pre-sold market. We know that the Negro buys by brand, and he buys the brands that he knows something about. Where does the Negro buyer get this information? We know that Negro customers are turning more and more to the publications that are tailored specifically to their needs, that give them the news and the information that they want to read about. Many leading businessmen and companies already know this. That's why so many of them are taking this direct, sure route of reaching the Negro customer. The vice president of advertising of the Drew and Watch Company, for example, says this. In many important cities throughout the United States, Negroes are important customers of the credit coupon. Therefore, it seemed that Ebony Magazine would be a very important advertising medium for us. We would say it was very well received, and from our viewpoint, a very successful campaign. From the Remington Rand Company comes this statement. Our records show that advertising in Ebony has been effective in many ways. As all good advertising should, it has built a terrific amount of goodwill and has brought a volume of sales and sales inquiries. A representative of the Allega Syrup Company makes this statement. 
Because of Alaga's regard for the influence of ebony in the Negro market, advertising space was doubled. Alaga's long experience in selling to Negroes now takes the most direct route to its best customers, reaching Ebony's two and a half million audience in every issue. And here are the statements of still other business leaders. Yes, many business leaders are discovering the most direct and most efficient way of reaching the new Negro market. Look here at the results of the same advertisement in two different publications, Ebony and another general magazine you can see that proportionately more men and women read the ad in Ebony than the one in the other magazines. And they did a better job of remembering it, too. A greater percentage of readers noted, associated, and remembered the ad in Ebony. But now, wait a minute. If the Negro market is so big and easy to reach, why aren't more companies going out after it? Well, often because of the feeling that there's something entirely different unusual about selling to the Negro. But is it really so different? What do salesmen say? The successful salesmen who do a good job of selling in Negro communities. How do you go about getting the order? How do I get the order? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't do anything. <laughs> anything different, that is. <laughs> I've been calling on these accounts long enough to know that the Negro just wants to be treated like everybody else. No matter who you're calling on, a little friendliness and courtesy help a lot. But naturally, anybody resents being patronized or talked down to. So I usually call a man Mr. Brown, Mr. Smith, or Mr. whatever his name is, until he tells me to call him by his first name. And of course, I always stick to business. I stay away from talk about race or religion or politics. That goes for talk about Negro celebrities, too. You know, this business about what good prize fighters and singers the Negroes are. Who cares? When a guy's in business, no matter what color his skin is, he's interested in making a living, in making money. That's uppermost in his mind. I guess maybe what I'm saying is that I try to help any way I can, sometimes with displays or ad materials or an idea once in a while. The important thing is that if it helps push sales for the dealer, it helps push them for me, too. Hmm. Handle the Negro account just like any of your others. Don't patronize. Stick to business. Get interested in the account. Pitch in and help any way you can. Sounds like pretty good sales advice. That's the secret of selling the Negro. Well, how about it? What do you think of this new market? It can open new outlets for you and for everybody who sells goods or services. It's still possible to get in on the ground floor when this market is just beginning to grow and to expand. The facts and the figures that we see here are just a small sample of what they promise to be next year and the years after that. Yes, here are men and women with money to spend. And they spend it for exactly the same things as you and I and everyone else. They buy almost every type of product and service that you have to offer. And they can be reached like everyone else through publications that appeal to their interests and desires. That deliver the kind of loyal readership that can be proved both in surveys and in down-to-earth sales. Here is a ready-made market waiting to be asked to buy. Here are millions of customers for what you have to sell. Customers with $15 billion to spend.
Let's not know. We've had it ever since World War II. There wasn't any opposition. You're going to sit behind every... That's the new girl. ...that deliver the kind of loyal readership that can be... ...for me. Yes, sir. Good office manager... ...for me. Yes, sir. Good office manager... Guilty, sir. You'd better hurry. My coffee... Yes, here are men and women with money to spend. And they spend it for exactly the same things as you and I and everyone else. They buy almost every type of product and service that you have to offer. And they can be reached, like everyone else, through publications that appeal to their interests and desires. That deliver the kind of loyal readership that can be proved, both in surveys and in down-to-earth sales. Here is a ready-made market, waiting to be asked to buy. Here are millions of customers for what you have to sell. Customers with $15 billion to spend. Um, and let everybody know, I will soon open the lines up when this document concludes. We have, like, roughly almost close to 40 to 50 minutes left of this stream, or actually of the documentary. That's the new girl. It's her first day. Some people say there'll be trouble. Some people saw trouble coming right from the start. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Miss Wright. Got a rush. Cat knocked over the alarm. Careful on the turn. management begins at home. You're late. Guilty, sir. You'd better hurry. My coffee's probably getting cold. No wonder I love to get up in the morning. I've got such a nice boss to look forward to. Incidentally, did you see the urgent note I left on your pad last night? A top policy meeting at 9.15? Yes. Mr. Dennis got back from Washington late yesterday, and he called the meeting after you'd gone. Thanks. This must be the new government contract. Was there any explanation? I tried to finesse some information from his secretary, Beth. <laughs> but she's as informative as a quiz program. Okay, I better get going. Have some hot coffee waiting for me. Yes, sir. Good office management begins at home. They'll quit. First one, then another. Whatever they do, they're going to make hell for that first Negro girl you put on the payroll. Look, Mark, we're not walking into this blindfolded. Now, Todd doesn't pay me to manage personnel so that personnel can run the plant the way it wants. What does that mean? That you're going to sit behind every secretary with a gun in her back? It means we can put this new policy through without trouble. Now, of course, we'll have to move slowly at first, no matter how badly we need them. Now you've said it. We need them, gentlemen. The Negro represents a labor force that hasn't even begun to be tapped. How about it, Kurt? Your department's been crying for help. Think we can make it work? Maybe. Works in the shop. Negro and white hands work side by side. We don't have any trouble. Well, how was it when you started? Not bad. There was a lot of talk about trouble. But the union was on our side that time. They called a meeting, and by the time they were through, there wasn't any opposition. Those were men, Kurt. They worked with their hands. How about women? Women are different. I think we're asking for trouble. Just what is it we are afraid of? Bad publicity? Money? Or we may be raising problems to hide our own prejudices. Look, Lyle, I don't think I'm a bigot. Lyle didn't say that, Mark. And I don't think I'm a man of prejudices. At least not any that I'd let interfere with profits. 
My department is sales. I'm mostly on the outside, and the man I sell the product to doesn't care what color the girl is who types up the bill. So because I'm on the outside, I get around. I hear stories. What kind of stories? Strikes? Slowdowns? Trouble. That's all. Let's call it morale. A lot of white girls just don't want to work next to a Negro girl, whether you like it or not. Well, now I'll tell you something. I'm not running for election, and I'm not going to run scared. No 20-year-old stenographer is going to tell me how to run my business. I've just come back from Washington. I met there with the President's Committee on Government Contracts. Believe me, it was no tea party between me and the committee. They were talking business. Since when is the President's Committee running Dennis Industries? We're not talking just about Dennis Industries when we talk about this. We're talking national policy. That's not new. We've had it ever since World War II. Under the President's directive, no company can deal with the government, can get a contract, unless its policies are clearly non-discriminatory. But don't we employ Negroes on the production line? That's not enough. As long as we set up a color line at the front door of the offices, or any line for that matter, we are discriminating. Aren't we also responsible to the stockholders? We can't afford... We can afford stuff. anything our competition can. If we can't, we don't belong in business. From this meeting on, our policy will be to hire every person we need strictly according to ability. If you want to set an example, put the first Negro secretary in my office. Nope. Not on your life, Todd. And have 12 girls quit because we're giving away one of the most worked for jobs in the organization? Now that would be discrimination. Just the same, I feel sorry for the first girl you hire. She'd better be strong. You're right, Kirk. She's got to be hand-picked. She's got to be so likable that any white girl with a chip on her shoulder will think twice before she starts any trouble. And so efficient that any man she works for will consider himself lucky. You know, I think the announcement of policy ought to come from your office, Todd, not just from personnel. We want every single person in this outfit to know that you're behind it, down to the last typist in the pool. Every girl working here should be made to feel that she's involved in putting through this new policy. Right. Is that it? That's about it. You gotta get going. Well, I'll go over the new policy with you. Let's my eyes Right from the horse's mouth. Well, go ahead, laugh. Maybe you won't think it's so funny when one of them is sitting at the desk next to you. Or at your desk, maybe. That I wouldn't wish on anybody. <laughs> Hi. Uh, What's the joke? Some oh. joke. The voice of doom here, spreading her usual morning cheer. Um, yes, and this morning she's colorblind. Very funny. She's got some very confidential information on the best of authority. I tell you, it's going to happen. It's terrible. It is. Oh, well, we're all going to lose our job. That's so loud. I happen to need my job. Um, me, I'll quit first. Well, what would we do without you? Oh, probably invite my replacement down here. Marge, what's she talking about? Oh, you know Ella. She claims they're going to start hiring some Negro office oh. help around here. So what? Well, if they do, I quit. You're kidding. Go ahead, Kit. You tell them. Me, they laugh at. Kit, you, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. You don't misunderstand me. I haven't got anything against them. Take Ned, the guard at the door, for instance. We're good friends, and I like him. But that doesn't mean that I want him or his sister working in the office with me. Girls, I don't bother them and they don't bother me. That's the way I mean to keep it. Where are you working now, Mary? Lane's. At least I was this morning. I might not be this afternoon if I don't get back pretty soon. <laughs> Mr. Graham should be free in a minute. He told you what he wants to talk to you about? All I know is he said, how would I really like to go to work? And could I drop around to the Urban League on my lunch hour? Have you any idea? <laughs> Put these books away, please, Miss Thompson. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Won't you come inside? It'll only take a few minutes. Oh, well, good luck. Thanks. Has Miss Thompson been filling your head full of tall tales?
Would you have a seat, please? Cigarette? Let's see. You've been working in Lane since you got out of high school, right? And now you've graduated from secretarial school. Must be pretty rough working during the day and going to school at night, isn't it? I think it was a little harder on my family than on me. They had to listen to my complaining. Well, it looks like it might have been worthwhile. How would you like to go to work as a secretary at uh, Dennis Industries? You want the truth, don't you, Mr. Graham? Oh, certainly. I'd give an eye tooth to work as a secretary. But at Dennis Industries, I'm not so sure. Oh, you're afraid maybe you're not quite good enough yet, huh? No. That isn't the reason. I'm more afraid they wouldn't want me at Dennis. Well, someone does. They called me. I didn't call them. Mr. Graham, we're not talking about anything that's secret. They've never hired a Negro girl. Everyone knows that. It's not that they discriminate. It's just that they don't hire us. Maybe things are changing, Mary. Oh, don't misunderstand. Oh, I'd love to work at Dennis. I do want a job as a secretary. And I could handle it. I know you could. I've checked your records. You have every qualification you need. Now let me bring you up to date. Last week, the personnel department of Dennis got in touch with every employment agency in town. It told them that beginning immediately, Negroes were to be hired on the Dennis office force. Really? Yes, really. They also called up the Urban League and asked us to help them over the hurdle. Sounds as though they're serious. They are serious. They've already started to map a long-term educational plan so that the schools around here will know exactly what kind of help they need. Well, they've approached every organization in town and asked for their assistance. This could be a tremendous step forward. But what about me? Suppose I do go up for the job. The personnel department can't make the people like me. They can't tell the other girls that... Well, that... That you're as good as they are? No, they can't. But they can give you every chance to show you are. Mary, right now they need us. And we certainly need them. If we don't take the chance when it comes along, it may not come along again. We have everything to gain. You have everything to gain. And nothing to lose except a job. And about ten feet of pride. It's a funny thing, Mary. Once someone offers you a choice, you can't ever go back to the way it was before. If you don't try, when you go out of here, you'll find your pride has shrunk to ten inches. If you do try, well, if you do try, you may have something to be really proud of. What do you say? All right. I'll try. Good girl. Well, how's the crusade for freedom at Dennis Industries coming? There's a girl coming over from the Urban League tomorrow morning. But she's through with personnel. I'd like you to have a talk with her. Sure, Lon. I'll be glad to have a talk with her. You know, talk isn't enough in a situation like this, Will. You mean you people upstairs are really serious about this? Let me point out one thing to you, Will. Dennis Industries does a lot of business with the government. Fine, and we turn out a good product. And the law says fair employment practice. It never fails. 
Up on cloud 19, the VIPs decide to work a miracle, and then the little wheels downstairs have to start grinding. Are you against hiring Negroes? That's not what I said, Lyle. Oh? What did you say? That I'm only an office manager. I can't make a hero out of Todd Dennis. Nobody asked you to do that. All you have to do is to follow company policy. And lose half the girls in the office while I'm doing it. Have you lost any yet? Not yet, but there's muttering. Yeah. I heard one of the girls say she'll quit as soon as we hire a Negro. For your information, she happens to be the most popular girl in the office. If she quits, it could start an exodus that would make the one out of Egypt look like a quiet Sunday afternoon. If she decides to quit, I'd like to know immediately. Anyone else for that matter. Lyle, I tell you, it won't work. The girls won't stand for it. Okay, well, you tell me why. Oh, come on, come on, don't be naive. You know the reasons as well as I do. For what? The washrooms, for instance. You know what I mean. Now, what do these same girls do when they go to the restaurants and the movies? Just supper? So they have no choice. Well, they won't have a choice here from now on. Now, look, Will, we've notified the unions and asked for their cooperation. No trouble there. Every department head has made it official all the way down the line. There's a memo out in black and white so that everybody can see it. And we agreed that the best way is to make a definite stand from the top down. Well, you'd think we're living in the dark ages. When are good people going to realize that this is the 20th century in the United States of America? With freedom and liberty for all. Yeah, exactly. That doesn't say anything about working where you don't want to. Are you telling me you want to quit? Oh, I probably won't have to. My job will just disappear into thin air along with the rest of the staff. You know, I don't understand you, Will. I've talked to every man in a responsible position here at Dennis. Most of them wonder what all the fuss is about. Few admit they don't like the idea of a Negro secretary, but they're willing to go along with the idea. Well, go ahead. Try them. But you, you just... You keep on saying it won't work. I wonder if you know how you really feel. Well, I'll tell you. You know those signs you put up in the plant? Equal economic opportunity. Well, you can wallpaper the whole building with them, but you can't change the facts of life. I've got to get home. What time is it? I don't know. Well, if this girl tomorrow morning passes all those tests, it's your job to place her in one of those openings you've been complaining about for so long. See you later. We're very lucky to find someone with your qualifications, Miss Newton. Thank you. You passed those tests with flying colors. Well, as a matter of fact, I thought I'd be too nervous to hold a pencil. All that's left is a physical, just routine. I'll have my secretary fix an appointment with the medical office. Kit, would you just alert the medical office that Miss Newton will be down in about half an hour? And now you'd better meet the man you'll probably be working for. Mr. Nelson, may I ask you a question? Would it be possible for me to have an assignment in the accounting department? Why? Well, to tell the truth, there's a girl in there from my class at high school. We're not friends exactly, but I thought it might make things... Miss Newton, as a new employee at Dennis, I think you ought to know our rules. We don't give favors. We don't give preferential treatment. I'm sorry, I just thought it would make... We stick to our word. Every employee is treated solely on his merits. For better or for worse. Oh, I see. And now I'll take you down and introduce you to Mr. Harden. As soon as I can. You have to wait. That's all I can say. All right, goodbye. You the gentleman who's been complaining about the lack of office help? You'll get someone to sit at that desk pretty soon. I'll have to dig me out from all this paperwork. I have somebody for you right now. You better have four hands. She's 22, graduate from secretarial school, honor student, conscientious, loyal, eager to work. Go on, I don't believe it. She's outside. Would you like to meet her? Sure, bring her in. And tell her to have her pencil sharpened so that we can get started. Miss Mary Newton, Mr. Kurt Harden. I think you'll find your work cut out for you. How do you do? How do you do? You should have seen his face. He just looked at me like he couldn't believe it. Like he couldn't believe it. What did he say? He said, how do you do? He said it twice. And then he turned around and went back to his desk and said he'd see me tomorrow. Well, what did the other guy do then? Mr. Nelson? Yeah. He smiled like there was some sort of a joke. 
And then he took me down to the medical office. Did anybody say anything about you being the first colored girl in the office? They didn't have to. You could see it in their faces. The way the girl in Mr. Nelson's office looked at me. Maybe you just imagined all of it. Well, that's a crazy thing to say, Mama. Why should she imagine it? It's the truth. You just don't understand. Yes, I understand. You may not think I understand, but I do. You think I can't understand because I'm your mother and I'm older, but, but I do. What you're going through isn't new. When I was a young girl, I, I had to leave high school to get a job. I would have given anything to work in a shop. But it just wasn't done where I lived. Nobody ever heard of a nigger working in a shop where white girls and white women came in to buy things. So I, I got a job cleaning house. And I cleaned house and cried at nights until I got married. Maybe my mother had something she wanted very bad and couldn't have and cried about all night. I don't know. But now I have you children. And I've watched you grow up and finish school. And now Mary's working in a shop and crying her eyes out because she can't work in an office. Well, maybe she can work in an office. And if she can, I don't want to see her throwing away the chance because she's afraid. Maybe those people hate her. Maybe some of them do. And maybe she's imagining a lot of it, dreaming of trouble to hide her fears. And if this is the way it is, then she's got to find out. And the only way to find out is to go to work tomorrow. Well... When she has her own kids, she's going to have to watch them get hurt and cry and, and be afraid. And she'll always wonder if she couldn't have suffered it for them and maybe made their lives a little easier. The way I sometimes wonder now. Seriously? Okay. I appreciate your getting here on time to tell me. You know exactly why I'm quitting. I think you may receive a personal invitation from Mr. Todd Dennis of Dennis Industries to present your case to him personally. That it should come to this. Tell him I'd like to see her right away. Let's squash this. And get Lyle Ross on the phone. Oh, uh, Beth. May I ask you a personal question? Of course. Where do you stand on all this? You've heard the policy discussion. How do you feel? Well, honestly, Mr. Dennis, I wonder where everybody's been. I mean, doesn't anybody in this company read the newspapers or go to the movies? I think it's about time we woke up. You can be a great help to us right now. How? By giving the new girl a chance. By making sure that she gets a chance. You mean by being especially nice to her? No, not especially nice. Just plain, ordinarily nice. Common, garden variety nice. You have a certain amount of prestige here, use it. Well, I wouldn't want the other girls to think I was doing it just because I was the oh, tall look, person. don't you start being frightened, too. Think about it. It's not an order. Just a random comment on humanity.
I'm sorry you want to leave, Miss Wright. Up to now, you've been an asset to the company. I'm sorry too, Mr. Dennis. Up to now, I've enjoyed working here. I suppose you'll be looking for another job. In a plant that doesn't hire Negroes, of course. In a plant that doesn't hire them to work in the office with me. Well, that's going to be more and more difficult. I think you understand my position? I know your position. I don't understand it. It's not difficult to explain. I know. I've heard it all before. Surely you don't expect us to adjust our policies to meet your approval. Frankly, I'd rather not work than to work under your new policy. Rather not work? Well, you're lucky. How do you mean? Lucky you can afford that alternative. I can't afford it. Neither can most of the people working here. Look, Mr. Dennis, I just don't understand why my leaving has suddenly taken on such importance. <laughs> I wish I felt flattered by all the attention. But I'm afraid I don't. Well. The fact is, you're leaving the company is much more um, important than a personal matter for me or for you. I'm not going to even attempt to argue with your prejudices. I know that in a few minutes here I can't change whatever has made you think the way you've been thinking for a lifetime. But if you don't mind, I'd like to put the shoe on the other foot. You're a popular girl here, probably with good reason. What you do, quitting that is, they set an example for a lot of other girls who can't afford your independence. I'm responsible for this company. That means I'm responsible to the stockholders, to the people working here, to myself, even to the whole country, indirectly. <laughs> it's too late to crawl back into a shell. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mr. Dennis. Miss Wright. What, Mr. Dennis? I'm going to ask you to stay on here at Dennis, in spite of how you feel. To give us... To give this girl... To give yourself, even, a chance to find out if we're right. You're putting me in a pretty tough spot, Mr. Dennis. Well, it may not be as tough as you think. You're making it awfully difficult to refuse. It would have been so much easier if you just bawled me out. <laughs> this is something that has to be handled reasonably. Will you give it a try? I think it's only fair to warn you. I... I may do all the wrong things. You may be sorry if I stay. Well, every day I'm in business, I'm taking chances. I'm willing to take this one. I'll think about it, Mr. Dennis. I will say this, though. It's the first time I've stopped to think about it at all. Thank you. Hello, Mary. Uh, the secretary is usually over here. Won't you join us? I'll give you a hand. Everybody, this is Mary Newton. Joan. 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 Oh. What's the car? 
Oh, no, you didn't. But actually, the girls have worked for Kurt Arnold. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was no mass walkout. No one quit. A few girls even tried to help out. Resentment turned to curiosity. Then curiosity became interest. In time, Mary was no longer the new girl. And new girls no longer meant trouble. So we all settled down again to the difficult business of making a living. I'm going to open the lines. We got like mm, roughly 20 minutes left in this documentary. So be patient. Enjoy. <laughs> That's the new girl. It's her first day. Some people say there'll be trouble. Some people saw trouble coming right from the start. Good morning, Dad. Morning, Miss Wright. Got a rush. Cat knocked over the alarm. Careful on the turn. management begins at home. You're late. Guilty, sir. You'd better hurry. My coffee's probably getting cold. No wonder I love to get up in the morning. I've got such a nice boss to look forward to. Incidentally, did you see the urgent note I left on your pad last night? A top policy meeting at 9.15? Yes. Mr. Dennis got back from Washington late yesterday, and he called the meeting after you'd gone. Thanks. This must be the new government contract. Was there any explanation? I tried to finesse some information from his secretary, Beth. <laughs> but she's as informative as a quiz program. Okay, I better get going. Have some hot coffee waiting for me. Yes, sir. Good office management begins at home. They'll quit. First one, then another. Whatever they do, they're going to make hell for that first Negro girl you put on the payroll. Look, Mark, we're not walking into this blindfolded. 
Now, Todd doesn't pay me to manage personnel so that personnel can run the plant the way it wants. What does that mean? That you're going to sit behind every secretary with a gun in her back? It means we can put this new policy through without trouble. Now, of course, we'll have to move slowly at first, no matter how badly we need them. Now you've said it. We need them, gentlemen. The Negro represents a labor force that hasn't even begun to be tapped. How about it, Kurt? Your department's been crying for help. Think we can make it work? Maybe. Works in the shop. Negro and white hands work side by side. We don't have any trouble. Well, how was it when you started? Not bad. There was a lot of talk about trouble. But the union was on our side that time. They called a meeting, and by the time they were through, there wasn't any opposition. Those were men, Kurt. They worked with their hands. How about women? Women are different. I think we're asking for trouble. Just what is it we are afraid of? Bad publicity? Money? Or we may be raising problems to hide our own prejudices. Look, Lyle, I don't think I'm a bigot. Lyle didn't say that, Mark. And I don't think I'm a man of prejudices. At least not any that I'd let interfere with profits. My department is sales. I'm mostly on the outside, and the man I sell the product to doesn't care what color the girl is who types up the bill. So because I'm on the outside, I get around. I hear stories. What kind of stories? Strikes? Slowdowns? Trouble. That's all. Let's call it morale. A lot of white girls just don't want to work next to a Negro girl, whether you like it or not. Well, now I'll tell you something. I'm not running for election, and I'm not going to run scared. No 20-year-old stenographer is going to tell me how to run my business. I've just come back from Washington. I met there with the President's Committee on Government Contracts. Believe me, it was no tea party between me and the committee. They were talking business. Since when is the President's Committee running Dennis Industries? We're not talking just about Dennis Industries when we talk about this. We're talking national policy. That's not new. We've had it ever since World War II. Under the President's directive, no company can deal with the government can get a contract, unless its policies are clearly non-discriminatory. But don't we import Negroes on the production line? That's not enough. As long as we set up a color line at the front door of the offices, or any line for that matter, we are discriminating. Aren't we also responsible to the stockholders? We can't afford... We can afford to... anything our competition can. If we can't, we don't belong in business. From this meeting on, our policy will be to hire every person we need strictly according to ability. If you want to set an example... Put the first Negro secretary in my office. Nope. Not on your life, Todd. And have 12 girls quit because we're giving away one of the most worked for jobs in the organization? Now, that would be discrimination. Just the same, I feel sorry for the first girl you hire. She'd better be strong. You're right, Kurt. She's got to be hand-picked. She's got to be so likable that any white girl with a chip on her shoulder will think twice before she starts any trouble. And so efficient that any man she works for will consider himself lucky. You know, I think the announcement of policy ought to come from your office, Todd, not just from personnel. We want every single person in this outfit to know that you're behind it, down to the last typist in the pool. Every girl working here should be made to feel that she's involved in putting through this new policy. Right. Is that it? That's about it. we got to get going. Well, I'll go over the new policy with you. With my office, still just... going to do. They've got to live, too. Who said they don't? Oh, take it easy, you two. It hasn't even happened yet. I tell you, I I know it for a fact. I got it on the best authority. Oh, right from the horse's mouth. Well, go ahead, <laughs> laugh. Maybe you won't think it's so funny when one of them is sitting at the desk next to you, or at your desk, maybe. That I wouldn't wish on anybody. <laughs> ah, um, what's the joke? Some oh. joke. The voice of Doom here, spreading her usual morning cheer. Yes, and this morning she's colorblind. Very funny. She's got some very confidential information on the best of authority. I tell you, it's going to happen. It sounds terrible. It is. Well, we're all going to lose our job. Not so loud. I happen to need my job. Um, me, I'll quit first. Well, what would we do without you? Oh, probably invite my replacement down here. Marge, what's she talking about? Oh, you know Ella. She claims they're going to start hiring some Negro office oh. help around here. So what? Well, if they do, I quit. You're kidding. 
Go ahead, Kit. You tell them. Me? They laugh at. Kit, you, you don't mean that. I do. You don't misunderstand me. I haven't got anything against them. Take Ned, the guard at the door, for instance. We're good friends, and I like him. But that doesn't mean that I want him or his sister working in the office with me. Girls, I don't bother them, and they don't bother me. That's the way I mean to keep them. Where are you working now, Mary? Lane's. At least I was this morning. I might not be this afternoon if I don't get back pretty soon. Mr. Graham should be free in a minute. He told you what he wants to talk to you about? All I know is he said, how would I really like to go to work? And could I drop around to the Urban League on my lunch hour? Have you any idea? <laughs> Put these books away, please, Miss Thompson. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Would you come inside? It'll only take a few minutes. Oh, good luck. Thanks. Has Miss Thompson been filling your head full of tall tales? Would you have a seat, please? Cigarette? Now, let's see. You've been working in Lane since you got out of high school, right? And now you've graduated from secretarial school. Must be pretty rough working during the day and going to school at night, isn't it? I think it was a little harder on my family than on me. They had to listen to my complaining. Well, it looks like it might have been worthwhile. How would you like to go to work as a secretary at uh, Dennis Industries? You want the truth, don't you, Mr. Graham? Oh, certainly. I'd give an eye tooth to work as a secretary, but at Dennis Industries, I'm not so sure. Oh, you're afraid maybe you're not quite good enough yet, huh? No, that isn't the reason. I'm more afraid they wouldn't want me at Dennis. Well, someone does. They called me, I didn't call them. Mr. Graham, we're not talking about anything that's secret. They've never hired a Negro girl. Everyone knows that. It's not that they discriminate. It's just that they don't hire us. Maybe things are changing, Mary. Oh, don't misunderstand. Oh, I'd love to work at Dennis. And I do want a job as a secretary. And I could handle it. I know you could. Now, check your records. You have every qualification you need. Now, let me bring you up to date. Last week, the personnel department of Dennis got in touch with every employment agency in town. It told them that beginning immediately, Negroes were to be hired on the Dennis office force. Really? Yes, really. They also called up the Urban League and asked us to help them over the hurdle. Sounds as though they're serious. They are serious. They've already started to map a long-term educational plan so that the schools around here will know exactly what kind of help they need. Well, they've approached every organization in town and asked for their assistance. This could be a tremendous step forward. But what about me? Suppose I do go up for the job. The personnel department can't make the people like me. They can't tell the other girls that, well, that... That you're as good as they are? No, they can't. But they can give you every chance to show you are. Mary, right now they need us. And we certainly need them. If we don't take the chance when it comes along, it may not come along again. We have everything to gain. You have everything to gain. And nothing to lose except a job. And about ten feet of pride. It's a funny thing, Mary. Once someone offers you a choice, you can't ever go back to the way it was before. If you don't try, when you go out of here, you'll find your pride has shrunk to ten inches. 
you do try. Well, if you do try, you may have something to be really proud of. What do you say? All right. I'll try. Good girl. Well, how's the crusade for freedom at Dennis Industries coming? There's a girl coming over from the Urban League tomorrow morning. When she's through with personnel, I'd like you to have a talk with her. Sure, Lon. I'll be glad to have a talk with her. You know, talk isn't enough in a situation like this, Will. You mean you people upstairs are really serious about this? Let me point out one thing to you, Will. Dennis Industries does a lot of business with the government. Fine, and we turn out a good product. And the law says fair employment practice. It never fails. Up on cloud 19, the VIPs decide to work a miracle, and then the little wheels downstairs have to start grinding. Are you against hiring Negroes? That's not what I said, Lyle. Oh? What did you say? That I'm only an office manager. I can't make a hero out of Todd Dennis. Nobody asked you to do that. All you have to do is to follow company policy. And lose half the girls in the office while I'm doing it. Have you lost any yet? Not yet, but there's muttering. Yeah. I heard one of the girls say she'll quit as soon as we hire a Negro. For your information, she happens to be the most popular girl in the office. If she quits, it could start an exodus that would make the one out of Egypt look like a quiet Sunday afternoon. If she decides to quit, I'd like to know immediately. Anyone else for that matter? Lyle, I tell you, it won't work. The girls won't stand for it. Okay, Will, you tell me why. Oh, come on, come on, don't be naive. You know the reasons as well as I do. For what? The washrooms, for instance. You know what I mean. Now, what do these same girls do when they go to the restaurants and the movies? Just suffer? So they have no choice. Well, they won't have a choice here from now on. Now, look, Will, we've notified the unions and asked for their cooperation. No trouble there. Every department head has made it official all the way down the line. There's a memo out in black and white so that everybody can see it. And we agree that the best way is to make a definite stand from the top down. Well, you'd think we're living in the dark ages. When are good people going to realize that this is the 20th century in the United States of America? With freedom and liberty for all. Yeah, exactly. That doesn't say anything about working where you don't want to. Are you telling me you want to quit? Well, I probably won't have to. My job will just disappear into thin air along with the rest of the staff. You know, I don't understand you, Will. I've talked to every man in a responsible position here at Dennis. Most of them wonder what all the fuss is about. Few admit they don't like the idea of a Negro secretary, but they're willing to go along with the idea. Well, go ahead. Try them. But you, you just, you keep on saying it won't work. I wonder if you know how you really feel. Well, I'll tell you. You know those signs you put up in the plant? Equal economic opportunity. Well, you can wallpaper the whole building with them, but you can't change the facts of life. I've got to get home. What time is it? I don't know. Well, if this girl tomorrow morning passes all those tests, it's your job to place her in one of those openings you've been complaining about for so long. See you later. We're very lucky to find someone with your qualifications, Miss Newton. Thank you. You passed those tests with flying colors. Well, as a matter of fact, I thought I'd be too nervous to hold a pencil. All that's left is a physical, just routine. I'll have my secretary fix an appointment with the medical office. Kit, would you just alert the medical office that Miss Newton will be down in about half an hour? And now you'd better meet the man you'll probably be working for. Mr. Nelson, may I ask you a question? Would it be possible for me to have an assignment in the accounting department? Why? Well, to tell the truth, there's a girl in there from my class at high school. We're not friends exactly, but I thought it might make things... Miss Newton, as a new employee at Dennis, I think you ought to know our rules. We don't give favors. We don't give preferential treatment. I'm sorry, I just thought it would make... We stick to our word. Every employee is treated solely on his merits. For better or for worse. Oh, I see. And now I'll take you down and introduce you to Mr. Harden. As soon as I can. You have to wait. That's all I can say. All right, goodbye. You the gentleman who's been complaining about the lack of office help? 
If you don't get someone to sit at that desk pretty soon, you'll have to dig me out from all this paperwork. I have somebody for you right now. You better have four hands. She's 22, graduate from secretarial school, honor student, conscientious, loyal, eager to work. Go on, I don't believe it. She's outside. Would you like to meet her? Sure, bring her in. And tell her to have her pencil sharp so that we can get started. Miss Mary Newton, Mr. Kurt Harden. I think you'll find your work cut out for you. How do you do? How do you do? You should have seen his face. He just looked at me like he couldn't believe it. Like he couldn't believe it. What did he say? He said, how do you do? He said it twice. And then he turned around and went back to his desk and said he'd see me tomorrow. Well, what did the other guy do then? Mr. Nelson? Yeah. He smiled like there was some sort of a joke. And then he took me down to the medical office. Did anybody say anything about you being the first colored girl in the office? They didn't have to. You could see it in their faces. The way the girl in Mr. Nelson's office looked at me. Maybe you just imagined all of it. Well, that's a crazy thing to say, Mama. Why should she imagine it? It's the truth. You just don't understand. Yes, I understand. You may not think I understand, but I do. You think I can't understand because I'm your mother and I'm older, but, but I do. What you're going through isn't new. When I was a young girl, I, I had to leave high school to get a job. I would have given anything to work in a shop, but it just wasn't done where I lived. Nobody ever heard of a nigger working in a shop where white girls and white women came in to buy things. So I, I got a job cleaning house. And I cleaned house and cried at nights until I got married. Maybe my mother had something she wanted very bad and couldn't have and cried about all night. I don't know. But now I have you children. And I've watched you grow up and finish school. And now Mary's working in a shop and crying her eyes out because she can't work in an office. Well, maybe she can work in an office. And if she can, I don't want to see her throwing away the chance because she's afraid. Maybe those people hate her. Maybe some of them do. And maybe she's imagining a lot of it, dreaming of trouble to hide her fears. And if this is the way it is, then she's got to find out. And the only way to find out is to go to work tomorrow. Well... When she has her own kid, she's going to have to watch him get hurt and cry and, and be afraid. And she'll always wonder if she couldn't have suffered it for them and maybe made their lives a little easier. The way I sometimes wonder now. Seriously. Okay. I appreciate your getting here on time to tell me. Ma you know exactly why I'm quitting. I think you may receive a personal invitation from Mr. Todd Dennis of Dennis Industries to present your case to him personally. That it should come to this. Tell him I'd like to see her right away. Let's squash this. And get Lyle Ross on the phone. Oh, uh, Beth. 
May I ask you a personal question? Of course. Where do you stand on all this? You've heard the policy discussion. How do you feel? Well, honestly, Mr. Dennis, I wonder where everybody's been. I mean, doesn't anybody in this company read the newspapers or go to the movies? I think it's about time we woke up. You can be a great help to us right now. How? By giving the new girl a chance. By making sure that she gets a chance. You mean by being especially nice to her? No, not especially nice. Just plain, ordinarily nice. Common, garden variety nice. You have a certain amount of prestige here. Use it. Well, I wouldn't want the other girls to think I was doing it just because I was the now boss. look. Of don't you start being frightened, too. Think about it. It's not an order. Just a random comment on humanity. I'm sorry you want to leave, Miss Wright. Up to now, you've been an asset to the company. I'm sorry, too, Mr. Dennis. Up to now, I've enjoyed working here. I suppose you'll be looking for another job. In a plant that doesn't hire Negroes, of course. In a plant that doesn't hire them to work in the office with me. Well, that's going to be more and more difficult. I think you understand my position. I know your position. I don't understand it. It's not difficult to explain. I know. I've heard it all before. Surely you don't expect us to adjust our policies to meet your approval. Frankly, I'd rather not work than to work under your new policy. Rather not work? Well, you're lucky. How do you mean? Lucky you can afford that alternative. I can't afford it. Neither can most of the people working here. Look, Mr. Dennis, I just don't understand why my leaving has suddenly taken on such importance. <laughs> I wish I felt flattered by all the attention. But I'm afraid I don't. Well. The fact is, you're leaving the company is much more um, important than a personal matter. For me or for you. I'm not going to even attempt to argue with your prejudices. I know that in a few minutes here, I can't change whatever has made you think the way you've been thinking for a lifetime. But if you don't mind, I'd like to put the shoe on the other foot. You're a popular girl here, probably with good reason. What you do, quitting that is, may set an example for a lot of other girls who can't afford your independence. I'm responsible for this company. That means I'm responsible to the stockholders, to the people working here, to myself, even to the whole country, indirectly. And it's too late to crawl back into a shell. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mr. Dennis. Miss Wright. What, Mr. Dennis? I'm going to ask you to stay on here at Dennis, in spite of how you feel. To give us... To give this girl, to give yourself even, a chance to find out if we're right. You're putting me in a pretty tough spot, Mr. Dennis. Well, it may not be as tough as you think. You're making it awfully difficult to refuse. It would have been so much easier if you just bawled me out. This is something that has to be handled reasonably. Will you give it a try? I think it's only fair to warn you. I... I may do all the wrong things. You may be sorry if I stay. Well, every day I'm in business. I'm taking chances. Uh, I'm willing Gary, to take what, this one. What, what, what do you want me to talk about, Gary? Because you told me to call in. So what do you want me to... If you told me in the chat when you want to talk to me, what, what you want to talk to me about? I'll think about it, Mr. Dennis. I will say this, though. It's the first time yes, I've stopped to think about it at all. all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You know, I forgot I didn't put the Q&A section.
that's my apologies. I'm sorry, people. You know, when I started this stream, I didn't keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, but what, what, I mean, let me just say my the parts for open the lines. So let me do this now. I to organize myself, people. Um, let's press back one again on Big J. But that's the end of the um the documentary. Um, I believe it played throughout the full. It might repeat from the end, start off again. But the point of the whole stream early in the first twenty minutes of it was to show the potential of our people during, quote, unquote, what they call segregation. And, you know, to spell the myth that was Negroes, a.k.a. Adios, doing bad back then. Some from that documentary back then, they were doing pretty decent. Now, I'm not sure where, if this is every state, but I would believe that the states that they named, those are the areas that black people were probably private, and it showed through the economics and the um, data from back in 1954. So the one thing I will say in regards to our potential now that, you know, depending on what we are, if we're not creating a business and stuff, if we have an issue in this country in regards to get what's needed, black people could try, if they have the resources, they have this, to try to spread out more. If you use the Internet, if you already have this online, I would suggest you do it. And if you travel away, try to see if you can make some connections and get some other resource to, I would say, better help your brother sister here in the West we call America. Because I think moving forward, um, it's going to be much harder because right now, black people try to get reparations. That's rightfully due. And right now, as you can tell, they're going to fight two nail to give what is rightfully ours here in America. And I my um I would say the only thing I would tell y'all to do and y'all could take a different direction is, is that do in the best interest possible. Um I think most of our people should try to come together not just enough but just come together and be a thinking tank to think how we're gonna move forward, you know? Because obviously they're not just gonna give it to you. Obviously, you know, they made a way to desegregate you with the help of some of our, I guess, um, leaders because they know the potential of when black people work consciously together. And the problem back then is once they were able to get us to, I guess, um, unify with everybody and, you know, from segregation to um, they were integrated, that's when the mindset of the so-called Negro has shown his true colors and decides that it was probably better going over this side. The so-called non-black person's ice is colder. So, to conclude on this section, uh, like I said before, it dispels the myth that, you know, your money and what you do with it can't either empower you or it's going to put you more slave. And we have the potential. So, as we push forward in this 21st century, it's going to take that certain collective effort to try to get where we need to be. So now, this is the first part of a broadcast done January the 19th, 2020. Be on the lookout for part two.